Did you know that if you believe only in what you can see, that you're going to stub your toes toes a whole lot in, in the middle of the night when you're trying to get up to go to the restroom before you get to that light switch. Think about that. If you only believe in what you see, when you get up and it's pitch black, you're going to stub your toes a lot because guess what? Even if you only believe in what you can see, the furniture in your house exists. That night table or that, that dresser or that chair exists. Even though... You can't see it. Even with the lights off, it still exists. Seeing is believing. That has become a a prevalent phrase in our world today. We live in a world of amazing claims, right? I mean, we've got... I was just thinking about this this morning. We've got that guy on TV that claims he can make a boat out of screen doors, and slap some black stuff on it, and it's going to sail right across the water. I'm sorry, I have to see that to believe it before I get in that boat, right? But you know what I mean. We live in this world of just outrageous claims, and so I have to see it to believe it has become a common phrase. As a matter of fact, Ripley's Believe It or Not has made a pretty good living off of that very thing. You've got to see it to believe it. Well, we have been exploring Jesus through the Gospel of John now for, what is this, our ninth week. I, we, we've been at this a while. Don't worry, we're, we're going to get to the end soon. But, um, but I don't know if you realize it or not, but we've actually been witnessing that very thing, that seeing is believing. A few weeks back, remember in John chapter 3, there was a guy named Nicodemus that, of all times, came to Jesus in the dark. And what did Jesus say to him? You've got to be born again, right? You must be born again. And how did Nicodemus respond? How? How can I be born again? For Nicodemus, seeing was believing. He could not believe what Jesus was saying because he couldn't see it. And then in the very next chapter, John chapter 4, we met the woman at the well, Jesus and the woman at the well. And and Jesus said to that woman that I will give you living water that you will never thirst again. And how did she respond? How? You don't even have a bucket. How? For that woman at the well, seeing is believing. Well, in today's Bible reading from John chapter 9, we're going to meet a whole bunch more people like that. People that had a very similar problem, even though they were really in a way kind of eyewitnesses to this amazing miracle that Jesus performed where he healed a man that had been blind since birth. Even though they could see the evidence before them, even though they knew that this healing had taken place, they refused to believe. Now, I want to preface before I dig too deep into the message. This is a really long Bible reading, you know, 40, 42 verses. It's a lot of reading. And, and I'll be honest, uh, Roxy and I met and talked about chopping this up and leaving some out. And, and I prayed over this all week. And no matter how I did it, we missed part of the story. We missed part of it that's important. So I think the best way to approach this this morning is in little pieces, you know. We, we, we need a little sound bite here or there. So we're going to kind of read this scripture in stages. Um, and I've kind of divided it up in, in stages based on this man, this blind man that's healed, in stages of how he grows to understand who Jesus truly is. And so I'm going to ask you to open your Bible. If you need a Bible, there's Bibles on the table. I will have the words up on the screen as we go along, but... I'm just going to invite you to, uh, to follow along as we read today, as we hear the story of Jesus healing this blind man. And what I want you to pay attention to today is, I want you to listen to how the world responds to this miracle. And I also want you to, to watch and listen to how this man who was healed responds. 
Now, this morning, I'm going to be reading from the the New Revised Standard Version. I don't believe that it's stated that way in the bulletin because I made a last-minute audible on this. Um, I felt like the the NRSV made a little closer um, uh, yeah, translation of the original text. So let's read this story. Let's begin. We're going to read the first few verses here. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he said this, He spat on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And then he went and washed and came back and was able to see. The neighbors and those that had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone that looks like him. And he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And when I went and washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. Begging. This man was sitting along the road or the path, wherever it was that Jesus and his disciples were walking along, and he was, he was begging. Mostly because it was the only thing that a man born blind could do in those days to survive. He was begging for a little bit of food or a little money to buy some food. And as they go by, Jesus' disciples look on this man, but they don't look on him with that he's a man in need of grace and mercy. They kind of see him as a subject of some theological discussion. And so they turn to Jesus and they say, hey, how about this guy here? Who caused his blindness? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Because you see, in those days, it was the people's belief that if you suffered some kind of a physical ailment, that it was some sort of divine punishment, that that was God's way of punishing your sin or your parents' sin. But no doubt, there's no doubt that this guy had sinned. Because none of us are sinless. There's no doubt that this man's parents had sinned. But Jesus didn't look at him and see sin as the thing that caused this man's blindness. He didn't look at this blind man and see him just as an object of sin. He looked at him and saw him as a man that needed to feel and know the grace and the love of God. Jesus also didn't suggest that God deliberately caused this man's blindness so that years later Jesus could come along and do a miracle. And so Jesus answers his disciples and he says, no, this man was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. All of us are born blind. We are born spiritually blind and and God does a work in our lives, or at least that's what I'm hoping and praying for for all of us is God has done a work in our lives so that God's Glory can be revealed through us, through our words, our actions. Now, Jesus' method for healing was a bit unique today. Some dirt and some spit. And then he rubbed it in the man's eyes. Yuck, right? I mean, you know, it says he spit on the ground. I I like to think that Jesus probably scooped that dirt up and just... Right? Mix it up a little bit, get it good, and maybe a spit a little more in there. And Can you imagine being that blind man? You have no idea because you can't see, but you can hear. And you know that something gross is about to happen, right? But he rubs that mud in the man's eyes. 
And then he says, now go to the pool in Siloam and wash. Do you remember that pool from last week's message? That was the same pool that the priests went to with the big golden pitcher and brought the water back during the Feast of the Tabernacles and poured that water out on the altar. That was an important body of water, an important fountain. But why mud? I don't mean to keep picking on Roxy, but we had some discussion in the last week here about why mud. And, and I got to be honest, I got pulled down a bit of a rabbit trail for several hours one day this week, just kind of looking at this. I mean, if you think about it, everywhere else in the Bible where Jesus healed people, he did it by simply touching them or by no touch at all, right? The, 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 one, the one kid he healed from 20 miles away. And then there's other examples where he simply just spit and rubbed spit in their eyes and healed the blind man. But this guy, this time, Jesus used spit and dirt and made mud. But here's what we need to understand. The healing power in all these miracles is the same. But Jesus varied the methods. He used different methods to heal people at different times because he wanted to keep the focus on the message, not on the method of the healing. And it's true still today. I got dragged down hours of rabbit trails just to satisfy my own curiosity when Jesus kept telling me, no, just stay focused on the message, not the method. I was uh, in, that, in that little rabbit trail I was going down. I did find something rather interesting. It was another pastor's thoughts on this miracle of, of why Jesus used the mud. And here's what he had to say. He said the mud was an irritation. And it encouraged the man to believe and obey. Because what did Jesus do? He rubbed mud in this guy's eye. And then what did he say? Go down to the pool and wash it out. So he rubbed this, this irritation was in this man's eyes, encouraged him to believe and obey. And we kind of know what that's like. Have you ever had something in your eye? You know, sometimes we get an eyelash in our eye or, you know, you get some piece of dirt in your eye. And, and if you blink and you can't get it out, what do you do? You go to the sink and you start throwing water and you, you wash that out. You want to quickly get some irrigation to cleanse that out. And so this pastor goes on, and I love this. He says, we can compare this irritation, this irritation of this mud in his eyes as the convincing work of the Holy Spirit bringing the lost into a spiritual cleansing and forgiveness. So this irritation in the man's eyes, sought him to go seek out irrigation. And that got me wondering, what about us? What, what about you? What's that irritant that you had in your spiritual eye at one time that the Holy Spirit kind of brought you to a washing and cleansed it for you? You know, what's the manner of healing that Jesus used to help you and I get the message of who He really is. So after a little mud in his eyes, the blind man's healed, right? That's kind of what the story says. His, his sight is restored. But then the problems begin for this guy. The irritation and the irrigation lead to a problem with identification. And throughout the rest of the story, as we, be, as we continue to read it, what we're going to find is that this, this man and his healing causes people to ask him all these questions. First, his own neighbors are wondering, is this really the guy that was, he, is it the same guy? Oh, he probably had an identical twin, right? It, it, it looks like him, but it can't be the same guy because he's been sitting by that road for decades doing the same thing. Or they were asking that question, how is he healed? And what I want to let you know as we continue reading this is we're going to see this happen four different times. Four times different people are going to come to him and ask, how can you see? First, it was his neighbors, his, the friends that knew him best. Next would be the Pharisees. They're going to ask him in verse 15. 
And then the Pharisees don't like his answer, so they bring the man's parents in. And at verse 19, they ask him the same question. And then when his parents say, hey, we, 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 no, we don't want anything to do with this, go ask him, he's an adult. So they bring him back in a second time, and at verse 26, they ask him again. Over and over, he gets keeps getting asked, how were you healed? But the problem is, each and every time, the people were asking the wrong question. They kept asking, how were your eyes open when they should have been asking, who was it that opened them? Who is this Jesus that gave you back your sight? You see, they couldn't believe because they couldn't see it. They had to see it to believe it. Let's, let's continue reading uh, at verse 13. They brought, they, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud into my eyes and then I washed and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. And so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe what he had, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know this is our son and, and that he was born blind. Excuse me, I just lost my screen back there behind me. So I'm going to let you uh, move the slides, if you will, Gavin, for me. Um, verse 20, his parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees. Nor, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age and he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So Jesus does this healing. He, he does this miracle on of all the days, the Sabbath, kind of starting to see a, a pattern here with Jesus, aren't we? And I got to tell you, this miracle again on the Sabbath really ticked the Pharisees off because in their minds, it was illegal to work on the Sabbath. And hear this, by scooping up dirt, making mud, applying the mud to the man's eyes and healing the man's sight, Jesus had performed at least three unlawful works. Instead of praising God for all that he had done for this amazing miracle of returning the man's sight, the Pharisees spent all their time just looking for evidence to condemn Jesus their love of the law and their hatred for Jesus blinded them from the true message of this miracle. Let's, uh, let's pick up the story again uh, at verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know that I thought, uh, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, I now see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have already, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear again? Do you want to be his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely into sins and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. See, when the Pharisees asked this man again what had happened, he told him exactly what Jesus did. But again, for this man, the how wasn't important. What was important to him and what he wanted them to start hearing was who it was. For this once blind man, believing was seeing. I love that in these verses we've been reading, um, as I kind of forewarned you, we, we are beginning to see this man's understanding of who Jesus is continue to grow. As he, as he retells his story and rethinks the events of whatever day it was, we can look at this and think that it all happened on the same day. We don't know exactly how it happened, but when he's asked to describe his experience, the man could only tell him, what had happened, right? He had not yet seen Jesus. We need to remember that. That's really important. This man had not yet seen Jesus. He'd only heard his voice. I love, uh, um, I have a, a video, a, a DVD of the Gospel of John. It's a, it's a wonderful movie. Um, and in there, there's this scene of this man once he washes his eyes in the pool. And I think it's important for us to think about this. This man had never seen anything. Never seen anything. Everything in the world around him, he only knew it by touching it or by having someone else describe it to him. Here's a little fun thing for you guys to do later today as you're sitting around the dinner table. Think One of you think of a color or an item, I don't care, Color is kind of fun to me. Think of a color and then try to describe it to someone else without using that color in the descriptor. And just see how hard it must have been for this man once blind to understand even what color was. And yet in this video, it's this amazing scene. He washes his eyes and, and this is when he's going back to his neighborhood and he's walking along and there's a ledge with grapes. Grapes of all things, red and green grapes. And I love it because this guy looks like a kid in a candy store. He's picking them up and he's feeling them. And I'm thinking in my mind, he doesn't know what that is yet until he tasted it. And he goes, you, you can almost see the look in his face like, whoa, this is what a grape is. It's just, it's so fun to me to think about what this man must have experienced when he first received his sight, and yet hours or just a day or two later, he is being drilled about what had happened and how it had happened. When his neighbors asked him, how were your eyes opened? In verse 11, what did he say? It was a man called Jesus. This guy named Jesus did it. But then when the Pharisees questioned him the first time, how he had received his sight, in verse 17, after he's thought about it a little more, he's a prophet. This guy had, he healed me. He must be more than just a guy. He's got to be a prophet. And then when the Pharisees bring him in the second time to question him, it's really interesting because they put him under oath. That's what those words give glory to God. When they brought him in and they said, give glory to God, they weren't waiting for him to put his hand up and go, hey, God. This was kind of the, the Jewish, if you will, swearing in ceremony. Kind of like um, when you go to court these days. I, I don't know if they still do it in the movies. They do. You got to go and put your hand on a Bible and swear to tell the, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Right. That's what they were doing. They brought him in the second time and they said, okay, we've talked to your parents. They were of no help whatsoever. So now we want you to swear that what you're telling us is the truth. But before the man can speak, the Pharisees try to sway his testimony. They try to lead his testimony by saying, we know that this man who did this to you is a sinner. But I love this. This, this guy... 
has been blind his whole life. He is an outcast in society. He's been looked down on his whole life. And he's standing before the leaders of the synagogue, the, you know, the Pharisees. He's got to be a little bit nervous. He knows that his mom and dad didn't want to say anything. But yet he stands strong in his belief. He stands strong in his testimony. And for the most part, his story remained unchanged. I don't know. He came along, he put some mud in my eye, I rinsed him out, except there's something interesting the second time. As he is telling his story, we see again his faith in Jesus starting to grow because in this second time with the Pharisees, he says that Jesus is a man from God. So first time, Jesus was just a guy. This guy came along and healed me. Then as he gets to thinking about it a little more, well, no, no, it must have been a, he must have been more than just a guy. He must have been a prophet. But now, as he's really thinking about what happened and how amazing it was, this must have been a man from God. But the Pharisees, and, and please understand, folks, let's not poop all the Pharisees because they weren't all bad guys. And, and, and sometimes we need to see ourselves in the shoes of the Pharisees. These Pharisees were unable to, to see past their preconceived idea of who they thought Jesus was. And even though there was evidence and logic before them, they didn't want to see it. So they got mad at the man because they didn't know what else to do with him. And it tells us that they drove him out. Think about it. This man receives the gift of sight. What an amazing, joy-filled day it must have been for him. He is just full of joy and all of that. And he's now able to see for the very first time. He's enjoying grapes and colors and all the world around him. And then he gets cut off. He gets thrown out of the Jewish faith. He's excommunicated, if you want to use that word. But we haven't reached the end of the story. Let's go back to verse 35 because the story is getting a little better here. Jesus heard that they had driven him out and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him and the one speaking with you is he. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, I came into this world for the judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus heard that this man had been thrown out. That this man had been tossed aside. And, and to get thrown out of the synagogue, out of the faith, meant that no one would want anything to do with this man. But Jesus isn't just Jesus the Messiah. Here, Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And so, it's just like that story of the Good Shepherd going and finding the one lost sheep. Jesus goes and He finds this man and He reveals himself to this man. Again, remember, this man has never seen Jesus. He's only heard his voice. And so imagine this guy sitting back where he sat for years begging, dejected because he's been thrown out, because no one will believe him. And this familiar voice comes and says, hey, I think you and I need to talk. I imagine that man's face lit up because he knew then. And then Jesus reveals himself to this man and says, I'm the Son of God. And I love this because that once blind man believed. In that moment, he believed and he was saved. He, was saved. he said, Lord, I believe and I worship. And he worshiped him. For that once blind man. Jesus went from being just some guy to a prophet to a man of God to Lord. All in this story, he grew in his faith and his understanding of Jesus. But the message for us is this, that 
It's not enough to just believe that Jesus is some guy in the Bible or some guy that people in church like to talk about on Sunday. It's not even enough for us to believe that he's a prophet or a man of God. We've got to believe like this man did, that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, our Savior. Way back in verse 5 that we read today, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And friends, it's that light that light of Jesus that removes our blindness and allows us to believe without seeing. The light of the world removes our blindness and allows us to believe in who Jesus is without seeing. It's that same light that makes us able to walk. I talked earlier about you know, if you, how difficult it is to walk through our house in the dark, right? We stub our toes, we trip on things. But it's the light of the world, it's Jesus Christ in our lives that, that makes us able to walk in the darkness of this world without stumbling and without stubbing our spiritual toes. But here's what we need to know. The only people who cannot see the light of Christ are those who refuse to look. The only people that can't see the light of Christ are those that are refusing to look. The man in today's story was not only physically blind, but he was at one time spiritually blind. But I love in this story, we get to see that not only were his eyes open, but his heart was open because he listened to the word of God. He listened to Jesus. He believed in Jesus. He obeyed what Jesus said. And because of that, he experienced the amazing grace of God. So here's my last rabbit trail. Because as I kept reading this story, I realized that we don't know the rest of this man's story. He doesn't show up anywhere else in the Bible. John doesn't mention him ever again. None of the other Gospels talk about this guy. And so I got to thinking that I really believe, I have to believe in my heart that this man became a follower of Jesus. I want to believe in my heart that that this was the guy that that maybe went ahead of Jesus before he got to that next town. This guy went ahead and said, let me tell you about a guy that's coming. Remember the woman at the well that ran back to her town and said, let me tell you about the man who told me everything. Imagine this guy coming. Can you imagine that guy busting in the doors today saying, let me tell you about a guy that made me see again. That's the the ending of the story I want to believe. I want to believe that, that maybe this guy was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified. I want to believe that this guy's heart was so changed that that he was one of that 120 that was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. I want to believe that this guy was probably standing alongside Peter that day when he gave that amazing sermon. But here's what I can tell us about this story. Is we, you and me, we are each like this once blind man. We've had an irritant in our eye. We've had mud in our eyes, in our spiritual eyes, but we too have been rinsed by the Holy Spirit. And we can now see because we believe. Which makes you and I the end of this message. In other words, it doesn't matter what happened to this guy. What matters is, what do we do with this story? How do we continue on? And so, I want you to think about this today. What's your, I was once blind but can now see story? What's your story that others need to hear? And then this week, pray about Where's your faith in in Jesus Christ taking you to share that story? Believing, friends, is seeing. Believing is seeing. Let's pray, shall we?